Welcome to Local Bias. I'm your host, Marion Kellner, and today I am very excited, very happy to have as our guest Andrea Cohen Kiner, who is the rabbi at Temple Israel in Greenfield, Massachusetts. So I've been looking forward. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. It's nice to be here. <laughs> I've been looking forward to this interview for a long time. So we're just going to jump right in. Let's go. And um, I would like to start with just a little bit of background, you know, where you have come from and how you ended up in Greenfield as the rabbi of the temple. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Minneapolis and kind of a suburban childhood. We had a really strong Jewish identity, but not a very strong Jewish practice. And they made me go to Hebrew school. They made me learn the tradition, but they didn't know it very well. So I thought, well, maybe Judaism is just for children. And now I'm a teenager, I'll let it go. <laughs> and then I actually found myself really drawn to the teachings, really thinking about them and saying, well, maybe people are supposed to try to live this way. And um, so at some point in college, I changed majors from undeclared to uh, Hebrew literature. And I would say I've continued to interact with Jewish literature and text and values and history ever since then. Uh, but I first got a degree in Hebrew education. And then after many years, another 20 years after kind of raising my kids, um, I went ahead and went to rabbinical school. So I've only been a rabbi about 20 years. Uh -huh. Could you uh, mention some of the teachings that drew you in that you found compelling? If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Mm -hmm. That's one. Yeah, that's a very powerful one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were welcomed into Temple Israel. And as far as I can perceive from my time here, once you arrived, the temple became much more active in the community. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could describe how you see the role of the temple, uh, both in Greenfield and also for the general area. Mm -hmm. They had an interim rabbi right before I came, so they were in a transition, and she did a wonderful job. But I think coming in, and I moved right to town and got right to work. And you know, I'm a mature person. I had a certain plan of what I wanted to do here, and so there was you know, this nice pool of energy to sort of draw from and um, get some of our programs going. I think we are the only synagogue in Franklin County, and I'm the only working rabbi in Franklin County. Um, so we're involved in cultural issues and social issues and educational as much as we are in ritual. I mean, except for the Jewish High Holidays, of course, are in the fall, they're very well attended. But other than that, like our largest, best attended programs, our special events and our film series on diversity, um, films on Israel-Palestine and the peace process, um, people really come out for that. Um, concerts, social justice uh, programming. So we're the center of Jewish life in Franklin County. At least yes. it says that on our <laughs> stationery. <laughs> and that's where the energy is going. And yeah. I get the sense that different groups are welcome into the temple. I know um, some Christian groups meet in the temple. Uh, I observed that the last weekend that there is uh, programming about Syrian refugees, things that are, you know, a little non-traditional outside of just the Jewish cultural religious realm. Yes, a mandala chorus uses our building. We have a beautiful building. The sanctuary is, has very lovely acoustics and a nice feel. And it's a good kind of space. We have, I would say, mission-aligned groups that rent uh, from us, including uh, Catholic Sunday School. They really fill up our building. They have a really big yeah. youth population. And they use yeah. our classrooms on Sunday. Yeah. So uh, Judaism, I'd like to jump into the, the religion itself. OK. Um, I grew up Jewish, very, very non-religious, um, sort of like cultural Judaism. Uh, but I think the tradition of discussion, of questioning, 
of dialogue, of mystery, mysticism, traditional teachings. It's just such a, a huge range and mixture of uh, mental, emotional, spiritual practices. And so um, I know you're interested in the mystical aspect of Judaism and when we've talked before, it's been very fascinating. So anything that has to do with these kinds of um, life energy within Judaism would be, I think, fascinating to hear about. Hmm. Well, I think the Jewish tradition offers a very brilliant cosmology. And what do I mean by cosmology? Cosmology means to be answering the question, like, how was the universe constructed? What are we doing here? What are we meant to do here? And what are our capacities? So I guess these ideas would be considered mystical, but I don't believe in believing in things. I believe in hearing ideas, seeing if they sound true, if they feel true, if they feel useful. I think that our heart is, and our mental perception is meant to sort of be the barometer, the smell test for if an idea is useful for us. That said, I find the ideas of Jewish mysticism very, very valuable. And they actually provide a very um, transparent language in which I can have discussions with people that don't believe in Judaism and don't believe in religion. And um, if you'd like me to, I could describe that very briefly, like a core idea of the Jewish mystical tradition. Sure, sure. I, I, I could just mention, I was in Israel a long time ago, like 1968. Wow. And I was in the hills of Galilee, and I was near Svat, which was one of the centers of Jewish mysticism. And it was this ancient town with little alleyways and old buildings, and the energy field there was I have never experienced it before or since. There's some power, great power in that. So I'd love to hear about some core tenets of it. Some great power. You're talking about an energy field and how does that get generated and how do we perceive that and so forth. Well, I'll tell you my uh, thumbnail definition of spirituality, okay? Um, we have physical capacities, we have bodies. We have emotional capacities, kind of like our circulatory system and maybe like the adrenals and some of the limbic material that makes the chemistry of feeling. Like dread has a different chemistry than joy. There's a physical aspect to the feelings. Mm -hmm. um, so we have body, heart, and then we have mind, mental understanding, and of course the mind has many, many functions. Automatic functions like breathing and other things. And also attention and intention and consciousness like choosing something or discerning. It has more subtle functioning. But when we're doing, when our heart, body, and mind are all doing the same thing, that's by definition we're having a spiritual experience because we're being that antenna from what do I want to be doing now? Am I feeling it? Do I want to be here? And do I understand that this is valuable and I'm choosing this now? And I think when we do that, it's like spirit or inspiration is getting right into our feet. And I think we feel energized and full mm -hmm. um, during moments like that. Yeah, so mysticism is that state I mean, one could, it reminds me of the state of creativity in general, you know, when everything aligns and you lose a sense of your surroundings and the details of one's history and so forth, you're just a channel coming through. So creativity, mysticism, sounds like the alignment that you're talking about and the energies of the universe coming through you so that people are often surprised Right when you're in that state, it's sort of wow! I didn't think this before, or feel this before, or know this before. It's very of the moment. I think you're exactly right, and I, I use the word alignment sometimes to describe that, and also being in the zone, which is what athletes and musicians. You have to kind of practice. You have to. There is a practice element, but the moments when you're there, it's just as you say. It's you're serving, you're definitely there. The language I use for it now is that there's a sense that I'm connecting heaven and earth. 
-hmm. And that would be just symbolic language for the higher and the lower. And it could be in anything. I could, when someone's cooking and they're in that state of, you know, a little of this, a little of that. Yeah. And something is motivating these choices. Drumming. Drumming. It's like uh, anything you're absolutely, totally involved in uh, seems to bring forth that kind of uh, experience. This is something we can all recognize. So you can see that we already have a little bit of a universal language for these mm -hmm. experiences that are hard to say in words. Yeah. So um, the Hebrew alphabet, <laughs> I, as I understand it from some things you have said, contains mystical symbolism. Is that correct? Hebrew is amazing. Hebrew, Arabic, and Sanskrit are said to be holy languages. And I guess, at least for Hebrew, that would mean that um, something essential and true and elemental is being expressed in the letters, the shape of the letters, the sound of them, what words they appear in, and where they're made in the body. Should I say one example? Absolutely. All right. Well, <laughs> one Hebrew word that everyone knows, but they don't know that they know it, is alphabet, because the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet are aleph bet. And uh, the Greeks took in aleph bet and they adapted our uh, names of our letters for the Greek alphabet. So a lot of Hebrew came right into Greek and then into English and other languages. But the Aleph, the first letter Aleph itself, it's actually a silent letter. And it looks a little bit like, is it Galileo that does that diagram of the man? Da Vinci. Da Vinci, thank mm -hmm. you. It kind of looks like that. The sound of it is silent. The numerical value of it is one or unity. And it appears in several of God's names, Allah in Arabic, Elohim or El in Hebrew. So that silent presence that goes in every direction and is just one is, is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And when you say the sound is silent, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to grasp what that, what that means. Well, it would be like uh, an A or an O that it, um, the Hebrew alphabet ha is made out of all consonants with all different sounds, and then it has what's called diacritical mark, which, which means little lines and dots here and there. So if the diacritical mark under the aleph is, let's say, that one, which means ah, then your aleph oh. is going to be pronounced ah. I see. So in and of itself, it has no sound, but the markings outside of it give it the sound. If it has a vowel. If it if has it no has vowel, one, it is not pronounced. It's just there. Yeah. It has a presence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the presence is representative of all that is? Yes. Yes. And then we give it, in some way, we give it a form if we choose to by putting in a mark that is human, humanly ascribed to the silence. Are, are you indicating by that, like the vowels kind of give yeah, it a like shape the mark, and a form? The mark gives it a human grasp in some way, the sound. Well, a way to articulate it yes. anyways. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So that's amazing. Hebrew is really cool. Most of the words in Hebrew have three letters in them. It's a trilateral word system. And so the Aleph, it's also going to be combined with other letters to make certain sounds. For example, the word for father is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and then the second, bet, which has a numerical value of two. So the word father, how it, how it, what it means, what the Aleph means and the bet means is that one generated a second one. And that means that means father. Those letters together are the Hebrew word for father, of. Wow. Right. How about mother? Um, mother is, um, again, that generative, silent, starting with the olive. And then the second letter of it is mm. <laughs> uh -huh. And that letter looks like a uterus. Uh -huh. That second letter looks like a uterus. <laughs> Wow, I know. <laughs> who would have thought? And the numerical value of that is 40, and that's how long we're in utero, 40 weeks. Wow. I see I'm not even making it up. I told you, it's amazing. 
<laughs> it is amazing, and those are just two words. Those are just two. They're two. They're they're very foundational words, though, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. In every language, you know, they're very important. In life, they're very important. I this mean, is true. yeah. Wow. So, um, when people learn Hebrew, is this part of the learning of the language, or is this something that's like a step beyond that? You, it's almost like a specialized once you get into the mystical aspect. There's a lot of ways and a lot of reasons to learn a language. And when I teach Hebrew, that I'm teaching people at different levels and for different reasons. Um, I find that learning the trilateral system, like, um, you know, if you if you learn one root, um, then any time that root appears, for example, shalom, that's a common word that everyone knows. But shalom is sh and m. And any time those words appear in any form with any vowels or suffixes or prefixes, it has something to do with wholeness or peace. Restitution, perfection, peacefulness, mm -hmm. repaying. So um, I try to teach people the meaning of the letters and then the meaning of the trilateral roots, the three letters that make up the, that word, because it's a really good mnemonic device. It helps you remember and go, oh yeah, I learned that one root, but now I know 15 words. Right, yeah, that's true in English. If you know the Latin or Greek, you can somehow figure out what it's generally about. So, um, I'm just curious, you know, growing up Jewish in a Christian mm -hmm. country, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in which I think the Jewish population is what, 1% or something like it's that? Little. It's little, tiny. Be, it's tiny, it might be three, but it's, in, in, it's really low. Yeah, it's really low. Um, how, how was that for you? Did it lead you to want to become a rabbi? Did, does it influence your activities as a rabbi of how to interact, connect, um, communicate mm. with the culture at large? I think my childhood was actually also influenced by the Judaism in the specific way of like, I was the generation that, that came like after my grandparents left Europe. So then I had that second generation immigrant experience. So there was a little bit about, let's take advantage of a good college education. Let's be successful here. So there was some of that kind of immigrant story in there. Yeah. Um, so also, you know, being a minority, it's interesting. I, I say sometimes Jews are off white because we are a minority, <laughs> but you know, I mean, yeah. but not all Jews are white actually, of course, but yes. um, it has this kind of funny status of being in, but not the same. I think as a child, I felt kind of special about that. Um, I wanted to understand Christianity and understand uh, the teaching of that tradition and make it make sense for me, representing a different tradition. Like, how could I honor the teachings of Jesus, which I found very meaningful, actually, the parables and the stories sure. and so forth. And um, how was that going to fit with my Jewish identity and so forth. So I think being a minority made me really interested in understanding different religions. Mm -hmm. And I guess that eventually did sort of blossom into doing it professionally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And being, I know that the Dalai Lama looks to Jews, you know, because he's in a diaspora from yeah. Tibet, yeah. as many Tibetans are, and the Jews have been for so long. And um, I was talking to someone who's inviting someone actually to the valley, to Amherst, who wrote a book on the illegal immigration of Jews into the United States. Because, you know, a lot of times Jews weren't welcome and they came in just the way uh, people are coming in now to find a better life and crossing the Canadian border and, you know, coming in in various ways. and. Um, that sense of being uh, not, the, not the majority has a very unique feel to it, inevitably. And I think uh, it'd be great to hear what she has to say about, you know, in the past, illegal Jewish immigration. Um, but 
In some ways, I think, I, at its best, I think it engenders compassion, you know, being um, in this situation, um, but also not quite a sense of safety. Hmm. <laughs> you know, especially, you know, in these times where um, you never quite know when the majority is going to try to find someone to scapegoat. And at this moment, it's not the Jews, it's, uh, you know, immigrants coming in through the, through the border. But there's that phenomenon. Now, do you, maybe that's why the program at the Temple on Syrian Refugees is sort of feeling about that. Is, do you see any um, connection? Just it's what you're saying is so traditional in a certain way because starting with the Egypt story, the biblical story of uh, Exodus from Egypt, we have the teaching which is, you know the heart of the stranger. Do not oppress the stranger. Love your fellow as yourself. And there's a lot of teachings about including, including the poor and the stranger and so forth. So I think that sensitivity really is in our DNA in a really um, early way. And I think for, you know that our work to um, support the Syrian refugee community with direct aid, thank God it's a really wonderful project. Um, I think for the Jewish people involved, it is actually a multiple faith uh, committee at the temple, but for the Jews involved, I think they really are coming from that root of like, we, we have to help where we can. Mm -hmm. I think that, Mary, and some of the people that um, are afraid of migrants, and um, suspicious of African-American people, probably also are a little afraid of Jews and consider us right in there, almost like the vanguard of the other. So that's why I say we're off-white. I, I think they're, I think they're all related. The prejudicial systems are related and, and people that have like others have more than one other. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have felt that, you know, with as long as there's the human capacity to perceive any being as other, you just put one group in, take another group out. And my thing has always been with animals. You know, it's like if people are speciesist yeah. and they feel animals are inferior, mm -hmm. other, you could do whatever you want to them because of that. As long as you treat anyone like an animal, including the other animals <laughs> that we share the earth with, as long as you do that, then you have the capacity to do that to any group of human beings. And I think some of the great thinkers like Einstein and Schweitzer and so forth always mention that. If you treat animals poorly, inevitably, <laughs> you're going to be tr treating your sister and brother human beings that way as well? Because the capacity's there. I think so too, and I, I also think that um, fear of others and fear of people who are different than us is really strong, and it's biological. I mean, when species meet up, it's like, am I gonna eat you, <laughs> or mate with you, or flee from you? There's a certain number of choices, and yeah. I think that kind of really deep human part of it, a animal if you want to mm -hmm. even say it that way. Sure. Um, it's important to know that we have equipment that makes those kind of uh, evaluations for us. Is this dangerous or safe? Mm -hmm. And I think because of our higher mental functions and our spiritual functions, we can go, oh, I didn't used to recognize that your story is so similar to mine because our faces are so different. Mm -hmm. But now I can see that there's humanness in you. I actually think that's a conscious choice and that's how we overcome some of that more fear-based or automatic thinking, which is our heritage as human animals. That's right. Supposedly the brain has a lot more pathways for fear than for openness. Doesn't that make lack sense? Of fear. So we have to override the fact that we're wired, you know, <laughs> to feel that way. And, um, and I think religion can play, you know, a huge role in if it's either if it way, one true. way or the other, one way or the other, for better or for worse. Yes. In other words, if I'm, here's what I think prejudice is about, any form of prejudice. I am higher because I'm standing on you. 
<laughs> yeah. So if I denigrate somebody else's faith tradition and then compare it to Judaism has all these great ideas and all the other ones have stupid thoughts in them. This is what I'm building myself up by standing on, on something else. So I think actually that's a very natural way to feel and it is sort of a conscious effort and we don't all get there, whatever religion we're practicing, we don't all get there to that oh, there's this great unity behind it all, and the Buddhists are using this language, and the Christians are using this symbol set, and Judaism is using this language, and animism is using this way of talking about mm -hmm. it and describing it. If you're looking for and the Islam. unity, you can find it. Oh, Islam, of course. But if you're, if you're looking for the unity, you can find that, and if you're looking for the things that separate us, you can find that. Yeah. I've been struck by uh, the Islamic teachings, which I think in their pure form really emphasize the unity. So that in there, in Islam, Jesus is in Islam, Mary is in Islam, Abraham, you know, that there's this sense of the, these common roots. It isn't like this is, you know, Allah's over there, for example, the way other religions might view that. It's very integrated with all these great prophets and uh, enlightened beings. Yes, because he's uh, 600 years after Jesus. He has to account for the other prophets and teachers. And Islam does actually honor um, all the prophets that you mentioned and others that were active in the Arabian Peninsula, That not so much in uh, Palestine and the area where the Jewish religion was born. Yeah, Islam is, um, has a, their highest value, their highest religious value is Tawheed, which is the unity of God. So, and, and Islam teaches that Judaism is a true path, but we're a stubborn people. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's kind of true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, if you wanted to give some core beliefs, you mentioned one before, um, that was very powerful, but some things that you would like to communicate, some things that you think Judaism can gift, you know, to the general consciousness. Yeah. Um, what would they be, or one or two be? Uh, I think one of my uh, favorite traits is the um, seasonality of our holiday cycle. And as you talked about feeling like, you know, um, unsettled because we've moved so much, we are wandering people but our holidays plant us squarely in the planting cycle and the harvest cycle, and I think tuning into that is really good medicine for the way we live now. Yeah, yeah, connection with nature. Mm -hmm. So amazingly, our conversation is coming to an end. It really flew by, and uh, I'd love to continue this conversation at some point. It's very, very Interesting. Thank you. It was fun for me, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's coffee shops all over town. We can continue. <laughs> yes. So um, thank you for tuning in to Local Bias. I'm Marion Kellner. My guest has been Andrea Cohen Kiner, uh, the rabbi at Temple Israel. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.